Hello there and welcome to the Q&A show. My name is Cyrus Fernando and I'm here every week here to take your questions. We have a special guest on the programme each week to answer your questions. So I want to encourage you, you can email us right now live at revelationtv.com and SMS details will also be on the screen throughout the entire programme and there it is. And joining me on tonight's programme, live and interactive, is Pastor Andrew Seal from the Ark Church Spain. How are you doing? Fantastic. Thank you, Cy. Yeah, Thank you so good. much. Thank you so much. So much as always for joining us and uh, it's wonderful to get uh, to have you on the Q&A show Andrew so great to have you. Great to be here as well. Special guest did you hear you say that? Wow. I do. <laughs> Keep singing. Keep singing. <laughs> I do say that's all my guests, to be honest with you, but, oh, okay. but it's like the shine off it, sir. <laughs> that's between us, and you know, you are a special guest. <laughs> it's all good. So we are live and interactive, and uh, yeah, this program is all about our dear viewers, so you can please send in your questions, anything about the Bible, the scripture interpretation, or anything that you have talking about Jesus Christ, or any questions that you have, um, Pastor Andrew here is going to be answering your questions this evening. But before we start tonight's program and going through the emails, I've got a topic and I'd love to start the program with this topic and get uh, Pastor Andrew's thoughts on it and this is the topic here. It says schools are failing to meet religious education obligation. There have been calls for more support for religious education after an Ofsted report published found that many schools need an ad to add depth to their religious education curriculum. Ofsted's new subject report, Deep and Meaningful, draws and on evidence gathered during visits to a sample of primary and secondary schools in 2013. In most schools, religious studies provision is superficially broad but lacks depth, while significant proportion of schools are failing to meet statutory requirements of teaching religious studies on all educational stages. Ofsted also found a lack of clarity around the RE curriculum, prompting calls for better governmental guidance outlining what should be taught and when. The Ofsted Chief Inspector Sir Martin Oliver said, a strong RE curriculum is not only important for pupils' cultural development, it is a requirement of a law and, to many, and too many schools are not meeting that obligation. I hope the examples of good religious study curriculum is in our report to help schools develop their own practice and support the development of strong RE curriculum for all. Now, Pastor Andrew, not not only are you the pastor of Art Christian's church, but you're also part of the Art Christian school as well. So yeah. this is a wonderful topic for you to give us an insight. What do you think of this art yeah. school? Well, we're very blessed over here, of course, to have the Ark, the Ark Church and the Art School all together and in the same building. But of course, um, we used to work in a school in England and uh, my wife did, and uh, we, we've seen some of these things. This isn't a new report. It's a new report that we're just hearing that you just read out, but this isn't new news. You know, I remember when we first came over here, 2017, one of these reports came out from uh, Ofsted in 2018. I think it then got repeated a couple of years later, 2021, and again, we're seeing it in 2023, exact, last year, exactly the same story. Yeah. You know, it's... it's um, there's underinvestment. It's, it's like a secondary, you know, a secondary course, a secondary syllabus. Mm. It's undervalued. Mm. It's um, not funded, you know, not given time. It's like a, a secondary cousin to the rest of the, the courses. And yet, you know, it's fundamental. You know, meant to be a Christian society, and yet the, the, we're taking God out of it bit by bit. So this, what we're hearing now, is not, is not news at all. It's, um, it's the truth. And but how like important is it that we try and find ways as a Christian body to instill our godly belief, our Christianity back into our schools, back into our children? Yeah. We always talk about the governments and they're lacking the wisdom and they're making mm. wrong decisions as well. We, yeah. We've lost a generation now. Mm. But in order for us to get godly, godly leaders for the future, we need to be starting at the foundations and that is with our children Absolutely. and schools. Absolutely. I mean, look at, look at society. You take God out of society, that's, we've become a godless society, and then we complain about what society is like when we have chosen to take God out of it. So no wonder we're receiving and experiencing these things in society. It's, it's vital. The Bible talks of it. So as over the years they've taken more and more out of the Bible and, and time on the, an RE education out of the schools, of course we've allowed other things in. Um, not only is it being undervalued, but and less time given to it, but there's less funding for the teachers. And, and it, I think it talks in, um, in the report, at least a couple of years ago, 
which I remember reading vividly, was the fact that there wasn't any good training for the teachers. The teachers themselves weren't receiving the, the valuable um, teaching themselves and their own development. So there's no time being spent on it, no money being spent on it, being taken out less. So less and less quantity of the Bible was being taught or, or RE. Is it vital? Absolutely. The Bible screams over and over. You know, um, in Proverbs, it says, teach the, teach the children the way to go and they'll never forget it in their old age, in Proverbs 22. All the way through the Old Testament, Deuteronomy screams, you know, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength and soul and, and teach your children the same. You know, wear it on their wrists, wear it on their arms, wear it on their heads, put it on the doorposts of your house, it says, so that they know how to grow up. And in their old age, God says, they will not forget God's ways. So it's vital to um, a Christian society and one who wants God in their society that we're able to teach RE. But you know, so it's not just um, quantity, it's quality. Mm -hmm. It's not just how much we're teaching, but not only surface level, but the depth of knowledge is missing. But not only that, it's what they're teaching. Even if they are being spent and there's funding there, it's what they're being taught. Yeah. You know, that I have no problems at all with teaching about you know, Islam yeah. and, and, and other religions, yes. teaching those things, so we can able to say with a good knowledge um, what they represent and stand for. Because quite often people are challenged, aren't they, in saying, what is those I'm always challenged. Christianity yeah. and everything else? Yeah. It's good for them to have that background information. Absolutely, it's vital to know that, in fact, because then you can show that you've judged, seen, compared, and you've made your choice. You know, the great, some of the greatest skeptics, some of the greatest Christians now have actually looked into other religions, yeah. and they've shown that Jesus is the truth. I know some incredible Muslims who, uh, who were Muslims, they're in our church even, well, now Christians, they've, they've looked at those things, but they've realized that Jesus is the truth. Wow. So it is, it's fundamental, but it's the quality as well. You know, it's, um, it's it, it, when you teach things as basic, and they keep on teaching it. It's like Darwin. Darwinism, for example, is a, a point that's been raised that, that you can talk of. They're teaching books that have been going around circulation for 50, 60 years. Well, Darwinism has been proven to be wiped out, yeah. you know, and yet we still teach it. So we, it's creation. And, and so therefore we can always put these other religions up so that we can look at them. But in the end, we must, you know, declare and be ready to be able to say, that the truth is that we that we in experience and through uh, through our faith is that through Jesus Christ, Amen. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Andrew, as well. And I want to encourage any of our viewers. Maybe you're channel hopping and you're tuning into Revelation <laughs> TV for the very first time. Maybe you're watching Christian TV for the very first time. I really would love to encourage you to send in your email and tell us you're a first time first time writing into a live program as well. And it is. The fact is we're here to spread the good news of Jesus Christ because we believe it is a lost world and it's a lost society that we're living here today and we are here to give hope. So for anyone who is tuning in, maybe to Christian TV for the first time, how would you explain, explain Christianity and the importance of a, religi uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, of course, it's been not in a religion at all. Jesus yeah. had these greatest battles with the religious folk, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you look all the way through scripture, the biggest battles and biggest arguments were with the religious types. He came actually to remove them. He came to wipe away their theories and philosophies and religions and build a relationship, a relationship. It's not a head thing anymore, mm. it's a heart thing. We're in relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent and his Holy Spirit lives in us. And that, that, that's the key issue. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't fall upon us now, as it did in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit now lives in us. Wow, what a truth. He lives in us. <laughs> that changes that. everything, doesn't Amen. it? It's a relationship. It is a relationship. Absolutely. Well said. Uh, we've got our question here as well. This one's from Jane. Thank you so much, Jane, for writing in. Question, please. How do I compare the truth of creation with the fantasy of evolution when speaking to a non-Christian? Mm. Uh, well, we, we actually just mentioned uh, evolution, Darwinism, of course, yep. in the 19th century, I think around, I think it was born 1810 or something. So we're looking at that sort of era. Mm. And he spent uh, most of his life, or the second half of his life, showing the Darwin theory, etc. But he, you know, he, he, he disclaimed that towards the end. And now we can see that these, there's four fundamental pillars to Darwinism, and they've all been destroyed. There's no links. They were waiting for these, as if he was waiting, he put this theory in, waiting for the links to appear, 
And from 1840, 1850, when he, he, he wrote these things, or the start of writing them, they, they still haven't appeared. Yeah. So we're basing a theory, and we're still teaching it in schools, something that's been, that's been completely depillared. It's been completely t shown to be not a true thesis. Mm, very good <coughs> question, very good question there. Can I just also say to that as well, yeah. when we look at creation, you know, you need more faith to believe that we came out of, of, uh, of the Darwinism than creation. Mm. You know, nothing has ever been created from nothing. You know, people say, well, it's always been around. Well, what was been around? When was the first atom? How did the first atom come about? What happened before the first atom? Yeah. Creation. You need little less faith to believe in creation than anything else. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Uh, this one's from Dave. He's asking about the Ark and how the Ark was built approximately 5,000 years ago and how they obviously didn't have the sophisticated tools and drills and screws and everything back in the day <laughs> as well. So how was the Ark built, in your opinion? I'd like to say how the pyramids was built. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, God ordained it. Yeah. No matter, and, and he, he anointed people to do works of art. You know, um, when you look at the tabernacle, there's a man, Bezalel, who was the, he was appointed and anointed by God to do it. So the first real question is not maybe how he did it, but how, who, who did it? Right. God ordained the building of that ark, and he built it to quite precise measurements too. And, and we can read about those things in there. But, you know, um, we need to know that it's, fa fa that it's factual that um, he made it and of the right materials and everything physical in the Old Testament, such as the ark, mm. is to show a spiritual truth, everything. Mm. Jesus says in Luke 24, 44, I fulfill the, the whole of scripture. He actually says, I fulfill it. I'm the fulfillment of scripture. So everything that we read in the Old Testament, so the, the ark from Genesis through to Malachi, all shows somehow Jesus. And the ark saved the righteous few until the flood came. Mm. So a day of disaster shall come, but God's righteous people were saved through the ark. And of course, Jesus is a type of the ark, a typology mm. of the ark. Those who are righteous are in him or in the ark. And when the day comes, which I believe we're close to, yeah. we are saved through him. Oh, wow. It really interesting as well is the same word in Hebrew used for the, remember Moses' basket? Mm -hmm. Well, the same word for the basket there is the same used for what the ark is made of. And, um, and that, that is like an anointing or, or a covering. It's called a covering. So what covered Moses' basket, which led people out of the Egypt, which means bondage in, in Hebrew, into the wilderness, but towards the promised land, that same word used for the Moses' basket is the same used to describe the deliverance that all God's people were in the ark. Mm. Isn't that incredible? And the covering is the same word used for how now Jesus' blood covers us so that when the flood, not that the flood now comes, but when Jesus returns and the, and the end of the age is upon us, the covering of his blood now saves us. Can you see how what Scripture screams out it's after? It's amazing. It's incredible, it's the Bible. It's amazing the use of the, the vocabulary, the words as well that are in the Bible and the meanings behind it as well. Yeah. For any of our viewers who are new to Christianity or new to reading the Bible, what advice can we give them to really get even deeper into the Scriptures mm. and learn more? If they're new, don't, don't read the Old Testament. Yeah. Start in the New Testament. Start in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Yeah. Read the things that Jesus did. Right. You know, some great channels on the television, you know, The Chosen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, isn't that wonderful series that Amazing. we've been showing on here? Yeah. Incredible series. So um, I think reading the Bible, but start with the New Testament. You don't have to read the book. This is the only book you don't have to read from the beginning. You know? <laughs> read it from the New Testament onwards and read what the things that Jesus and his disciples did from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They've called the four Gospels for a reason. Yeah. And they're the four good news is, and they actually describes, and it's scriptural, and the meaning of the words for those four Gospels is evangelists. So they're the way in. They build you up in the faith. Mm. And then carry on reading through to the, uh, the, old, the New Testament. And then maybe then go back to, go to the beginning, which is the New Testament, the Old Testament, starting with Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> That's how Fantastic. I would recommend. Great advice. Great <laughs> advice. This one's from Shirley in Step, though. Thank you so much, Shirley. Uh, she's asking about children in heaven. Hi to you both. Great show as normal. When children go to heaven, do they grow older, possibly until the age of our new bodies? Shirley. Okay. The veil has been lifted a little bit on 
our bodies. In 1 Corinthians 15, I think 45 to 46 uh, and verses 39 there, it talks of the five changes that um, we'll experience. Our mortal bodies will change to immortal ones, our perishable to imperishable, from our lowly to powerful. You know, and, and there's five changes go on there. For Ch well, it does also say that the lion will lie next to the lamb. That's a, a millennial kingdom phraseology. There shall be no perishable, perishing in other words. So I, I, I believe that, and Jesus himself, when he uh, was seen upon the earth, he showed us again behind that veil. There'll be no growing old, sorry. There'll be no deterioration or perishing of the body. Wow. So they'll remain like that. Fantastic. Uh, this one here is from Monica. Monica is asking for interpretation. Could you please uh, explain Luke 21, verse 32, as it appears to mean the generation Jesus was speaking to? So we've got it here, oh, yeah. Luke 21, 32, and it says this, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by, me, by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words by no means pass away. Yeah. A confusing verse for people because they think generation, so the misleading or the deception that you could, or the misunderstanding there is that you think, well, if that was the generation, and we use the, the word for generation as, you know, the, this generation, um, then why hasn't Jesus, why didn't Jesus come back in the time of the disciples? But actually that word there in generation means the race, so the human race shall mm. not depart. Shall, these things shall not happen until everything that's fulfilled, that Jesus says will be fulfilled. When you carry on through to Matthew 25, it starts to say about the, the signs of the end of the age. No, nothing shall not be done. Everything shall be completed that's been prophesied until the, until the end of the race. So the generation word there means race. There's, in, there's always two or three different meanings. Yeah. And to translate from the Hebrew, sometimes the Greek into the English, they have yeah. to use the best word possible. So I would use the word race there, and now you'll understand the full meaning of it. Wow, fantastic. This one here is coming in from Manissa. Good evening, Cyrus and Pastor Andrew. My question is, I would love to improve fellowship and to develop a better understanding about the Bible and to apply it towards my life. Can you please recommend any useful websites that would inspire and encourage people like me? That's from Manissa. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I would go to your church. Mm. Your, your, John says that there's gardens, it even mentions gardens. Jesus actually referred to the word gardens. Do you remember on the, on the um, feeding of the 5,000? Yes. What did he do? Mm -hmm. He actually put them all in little groups. Yeah. But that word there, groups, means gardens, little gardens. Yeah. Then you go to um, John, and John talks of um, the gardener in his garden doing his gardening. Now, what's he really talking of there? Who's the gardener? Mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. Who... Where does, where's he doing the gardening in, in his garden? And who's the garden? The churches that he's placed you in. So all the way through scripture, um, the recommendation from Jesus is that we go to the garden he's placed us in, which is the church that God has given to you. Mm -hmm. you know, we're meant to be in fellowship. Mm -hmm. in that, first of all, that fellowship, a church environment. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, can that be proved? Oh yeah, look at scripture. When James says, you know, those who are sick, he doesn't say, well, go and look for a church. He takes it for granted that you're part of a church. Yeah. Why? Because he says, go to your elder. So immediately you can see that he's taking it, James, for granted that you're part of a fellowship. You're far part of a foundational um, congregation or a church or ecclesia um, of, a, of people who will, are there. And he chooses you for that one because he knows what you need. Yeah. You need to have people around you to encourage you, to help you. When you're going through a hard time, where'd you go? Yeah. So my recommendation is no website. My recommendation is uh, to tell you the truth, is to give you truth. As yeah. a pastor, I give truth. What you do with it is up to you. Yeah. It's actually find, is to find a local fellowship and then look for that fellowship which shares the truth, Jesus. Mm. The word fellowship actually means sharing bread. Mm. Who's bread? Mm. The bread of life, Jesus says. In John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Mm. So fellowship is sharing bread, which is sharing Jesus. So look in that church to see if they disciple, they have small home groups, and in then you come together 
and you go, you learn the Bible with one another in a smaller group, like a home group or a small fellowship. Mm -hmm. And there you get to um, enjoy running through the Bible with one another yeah. and, and seeing what each other's need, going through it together. It's so much more different. I can't, probably every week I get emails onto the Q&A show from viewers saying they find it hard, so hard to sometimes fit into churches mm -hmm. and they sometimes try several churches and find that difficulty. What can we advise our viewers under that Keep circumstance? Keep going. Yeah. God has got a church for you. Mm. Um, if there's no perfect church, mm. you go to the church and you keep going. Mm. You know, the problem is in many, many churches, in fact, worldwide, the problem, the problem with it is the church itself and you're looking for something that's perfect. And then you may get upset and you, because that's, you will get upset. Mm. You will be put out. You will not get all that you want. Why? Because he wants you to grow up as a Christian. Yeah. We're there. You pray for patience. He isn't just going to give you patience. He's yeah. going to put someone in front of you that's going to test your patience. Yeah. We're there to help each other. Iron against iron, the Bible yeah. says. So, but the, the, the real problem though is, Si, is that um, we leave churches or we don't join churches yeah. for the very reason we're meant to be there. Yeah to forgive one another, exactly. to grow up with one another, yeah. to encourage one another, to say, come on, spur wow. one another up. Don't stay there. Come on, you can do it. I think that's such great advice. And I really pray that's, that's touched someone because pretty much every week we get that same question on the Q&A show of people that are finding it so hard to find the <laughs> yeah. church. But like you said as well, not all churches are perfect as well, but we do need each other. So yeah, very good indeed. This one, this next message is also relating to the church. It says, hi, dear brothers, what a blessing you are. Can you please tell me your views on replacement theology, um, the re replacement theory. I don't agree with it, but my church does. Mm. Mm. Talking about Israel mm -hmm. and uh, the land of Israel and all around Israel and we being replacing of the Jewish nation. Um, it's, it's not scriptural for me. It's not scriptural. The Romans talks of it. We're a, we're a branch of being grafted in. And who, what's he talking of? He's talking of us and grafted in through the Jewish faith, through Abraham and the faith of Abraham. The faith of God through Abraham, the father of the, father of the faith. And we have been blessed by them. I mean, Je Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> and everything points to Israel. And it's the time clock for God. You, you look through, right through from Genesis, right through to Revelation. Israel is central. Yeah. And the the people of Israel, the Jewish nation, are the people God's chosen to sh to for Him to show His nature, His character, how He deals with humankind, and you know those who come up against who He's chosen have all failed. And right now, Israel has come back to what it is now—the center of all things in the news. Am I right in saying the other the other week you were talking about Israel and you're very much pro-Israel, and someone in your church even left? Is that right? What happened in your church? Or something happened in your church, did it? Was it your church? Yeah, it was, oh, it was on, on Sunday, yeah. We, we, um, we, are, we are Israel, we are pro-Israel. Yeah. We believe that it's, uh, Israel is the center of uh, God's time clock and, yes. and it's a special chosen nation. Yeah. I can't see how you can't see that. Yeah. And it's all the way through scripture. Yes. And, um, and when you bless Israel, the nation of Israel, then you are blessed. Yes. Um, we pray for them every month. Yes. Um, and we declare the truth of that. But of course, in this environment that we're in now, there's a real divide in this anti-Semitism and or pro-Palestine. It's like a pro-Palestine, pro-Israel. Yeah. They, they, they can't be both, you're well, either at, one or the, the other. It's the way the media are portraying everything as well, isn't it? As well, Absolutely. Yeah. This, this darkness is actually growing, just as it says it would do in the, for the signs of the end of the age. Mm. And we, we, we've declared this in our church, you know, mm. um, openly and boldly. We've, mm. got to prepare, we've got to draw the line in the sand and say, do we are on the side of God or not? Yeah. So we did declare this recently. And yeah, we've had people who walk out. Really? You know, yeah, who walk out uh, not believing it. But you know, truth, we never force it upon people. We just declare truth. Yeah. And uh, all the way through scripture, Israel is the apple, the there apple of go. God's eye. You poke someone in the eye and that, that part where it says poke you in the eye, the eye part there is as part of the retina, which is the most sensitive of the most sensitive. Yeah. You yeah, poke someone yeah. in the eye, they're going to fight, knock you back. That's what God does when you poke at Israel. There you go. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Eddie from Birmingham has written in, say hi, Pastor Andrew. He's asked about the civil rights activist, Dr. Martin Luther King and the evangelist, Dr. Billy Graham, were two monumental figures of the 20th century Christianity. 
but they greatly dif they differed greatly on certain doctrines. In his writings, Dr. King denied the virgin birth. He wrote, for we must admit that the evidence of the tenability of this doctrine is too shallow to convince any objective thinker. Meanwhile, Dr. Graham, in his writings, insisted the virgin birth of Christ was a foundation stone of the Christian faith. Why do you think the two men disagreed on this point? That's from Eddie. Mm. I'm a Billy Graham. It's a foundational block of the Christian faith. Why? Because if Jesus was, has to be man and God, in fact, it's, in, it's actually um, prophetic that the one, you read in Isaiah, she'll be born of a virgin, you know? And, and all the way through scripture there, it refers to that and takes that as granted. It's a, you know, the enemy wants to take away little bit by little bit the Christian faith. It has to attack it because his, his, his whole, de whole um, existence depends on, uh, you know, Christians not being around. He knows his time is short and he'll egg away, just take a little bit, but won't take away chunks because that'd be too obvious. Mm. So he just chips away at the faith a little bit by little bit. So real fundamentals like this, we need to say, yeah, we can't go on, on that logic. logic. Our, our, our relationship isn't based with, on Jesus on logic, it's based on faith mm. and his, his word says that. So we therefore, and it's, a, and it's a big fundamental block, we therefore believe in what God says it is that, as well as knowing it's a prophetic call of which Evidence shows also, if you're going to look at evidence in the New Testament, that's, you know, Mary knew, Joseph knew, and the people around you. Mm. you know, they knew something special about Jesus. Mm. But besides all that, it's, a, it's prophetic and it's a truth and it's a fundamental truth. You know, we even have, uh, even today, we've had bishops, archbishops, standing up saying there's doubt over the virgin birth. No, there isn't any doubt. Mm. You know, we, there will be... Um, there will be controversies over the things that are most sacred, you could say, to the things of God. What are the most things on God's heart? You know, look, whether it be baptisms, whether it be, uh, um, whether it be creation, whether, whether it be the virgin birth, whether all these, or Israel, mm -hmm. anything that's close to God's heart is attacked. You watch, you yeah, watch out for it. Truth. So we've got to stand for truth. Again, we've got to draw that line in the sand. Do we f have belief in it or not? The things, we could say the things about, um, uh, is Jesus going to come back before, you know, before or after, or, or things are going to come to a, to a halt? You know, Jacob, when's Jacob ladder going to kick in? Are we going to be around, you know, yeah. post all this sort of thing? But do we just have faith that uh, our role is to believe in the things that God says, even if we don't understand it? Exactly. And he will reveal what he wants to do at the right time for us individually. For anyone who's tuning in and they're non-believers or maybe they're watching Christian TV for the first time and we're talking about Jesus' return, Jesus coming back, can you just explain that for our viewers tonight? Wow. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. <clears throat> There's right through from Genesis, it talks of, um, of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. You look at the very first word of the Bible. The very first word in the Bible, uh, Bereshit in Hebrew, actually starts to show you that it's the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. The first word of the Bible in the first sentence of the Bible, in the first book of the Bible, already screams of those three. Jesus and, and, and the prophetic words in the Old Testament that the, they're looking for a Messiah. And you know, there's 350 prophecies about Jesus or the Messiah would come and Jesus fulfilled every single one in his life. Wow. That is exactly. on its own a miracle. Yeah. So a mathematician put it like this, you know, certainty is 999 to one. Mm -hmm. The chances of one person fulfilling that many prophecies is one to the power of 50. It's like a trillion, 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 <laughs> trillion, 50 times over to one. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled every single one. But there's another prophetic word which Jesus declares while he's here that I shall return. So I shall come back like the bridegroom shall come for his bride. Yes. Well, very basically is that he's the bridegroom. We, the believers, are the bride. And his promise to us is that the bridegroom shall come back for us on his second return. And the promises are that everything will change. We'll enter into uh, eternal kingdom shall be inaugurated when that happens. Yeah. So all the way through scripture, 
we see that Jesus promises, and in the old, old New Testament books, that Jesus shall return. And of those promises, there's about 450, even more than his first coming, of which nearly all have been fulfilled. Wow. wow. So if we see that he's fulfilled the first lot on his first coming, how certain can we be that he shall return for his bride, us who believe? Amazing. Now, this <laughs> one's from uh, Alwyn to say from South Wales. Hi to you both. Thank you for your answers. What do you think of the prosperity gospel? Are the ones preaching this genuine or are they in it for their own pockets? Jesus said to give and you shall receive, but they're talking it out of the context. They're taking it out of context. That's from Alwyn in South Wales. Great question. What is the prosperity gospel? Explain to our viewers. It's quite a big thing in America where a lot of it is you, you pray for something that you want or a physical need and, and you receive it. Prosperity there is about money and the prosperity gospel is about money, funding, big houses, richness, etc. But you know the word prosperous in the original Hebrew is, is the riches of heaven belong to, to us. But that word prosperity and riches is about spiritual. It has a very small connection to physical, which is therefore the money. So if you look at a Hebrew word or a Greek word, especially the Hebrew word, then you'll see that it has many different meanings. For example, let's um, have a think of a word, salvation. Salvation has got 14 different meanings to help, to aid, to be rescued, to be saved, etc., etc. Yes. Well, that word prosper prosperous is to do, has, has many different meanings. And only half of a half of one is about physical or material or monies. Mm -hmm. the, it's mainly all, nearly all, nine, someone said 99% of it is spiritual richness, mm. spiritual mm. prosperity. And you know, when you're on your deathbed, you ain't going to be worrying about how much money you got. You're going to be worrying about what you did with your life. Yeah. And the first thing to do with, with, with your life is to give it to the Lord Jesus. Give your life to the Lord Jesus so that you're going to be with him for eternity. And do it today. Do it now. In Jesus' name. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Great advice, Andrew. Uh, John's written in to say, I'm facing eviction in my housing, which has changed. And it's, I'm, I'm having panic attacks. Um, and he's very scared at the moment. So what message of hope can we give to someone like John or any of our viewers who are going through serious situations in their own personal lives? Yeah. You know, there's a beautiful word in uh, the Bible that says cast. And this word cast is the, there's one word in particular where, where this is used in this meaning. It's the only time in the Bible is when, do you remember when Jesus entered um, uh, on um, Palm Sunday? Mm -hmm. And he said, get a donkey ready for me. And then he said, cast your blankets onto the donkey. Well, that word cast there is the only time that version of that word is used. But what was really Jesus talking about? He wasn't saying, he wasn't talking about physical things. In fact, we already have explained that everything in the Bible, anything physical is showing a spiritual truth. So what he's really saying there, it's the same word used where you cast your worries your anxiety, it's, it's linked to that. It's the only time it's used. So you cast your worries, your anxieties onto the donkey. Yeah. Who rode that donkey? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he's saying to us, all your worries, they will come. It doesn't say if you, you have worries. He says when you have your worries, when you have your anxieties, when you could be moved out of your house, mm -hmm. cast them, which also means one way. It doesn't mean you give them to Jesus and take them back. Mm. This is important. Mm. You actually cast all your worries onto him. You just release it. You let release. it out. Release. It. It's an act of faith. God, it's onto you now. You deal with it. Yeah. You, and, and he will. Yeah. He says, if you, Matthew 6, 33, I love this verse. He says, you know, if you need something, he says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and I shall give you all that you need. Let me tell you, I've, I've tested that and <laughs> tested that over and over wow. and he does it. Yeah. You don't seek for your physical needs. You yeah. seek to seek his kingdom yeah. and him and he will then provide all your needs. And more so. Wonderful. And verse. more so. And more so. Well, sometimes we think so small, but God's got an even bigger idea. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's a beautiful word in uh, you know, the, ble the Aaronic blessing. Yeah. It's a picture of... Um, of, of Jesus who kneels before you in Numbers chapter six. He kneels before you and it's Jesus who's kneeling before you. And he has something behind his back and he wants to bless you with it. But he says, 
drop what you've got and let me give you what I've got for you. Yeah. And it's dropping what you think you need and letting Jesus fulfill you with what he knows you need. And it's always greater. It will blow your mind. There you go. There you go. Sometimes oh. we, we pray too small. Yeah. So was it John? <laughs> we don't realize the power of God. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, John. So John, you yeah. know, um, not easy. And I know it's not easy because I've done it myself. And sometimes I have to do it repeatedly. Take that worry, take that concern and hand it over to Jesus. Do it right now. Why delay? And, and when you know, you know you've done it because peace will transform you. It, do you know, I had this once, I've got a wonderful testimony. I've got time to share Yes, please this. do. It's a, it's a testimony. When I was in the lowest, one of my lowest places, maybe like you are in now, and I couldn't even pray, I grabbed hold of my wife and said, please pray let's, about, about this issue. And it was an issue that was getting worse by the hour. Wow. It was 1,800 miles away from where I was. I couldn't do anything about it. But, you know, I, I sat down and we just prayed, just a simple word, Jesus, take it. And I knew at midnight, when I'd done it four times, that it had been done, it had been dealt with. The next morning, I got a phone call, which was, a, which was out of the blue, a huge problem. And that person rang me and said, by the way, I've heard that about this problem, I've resolved it. And it was a problem that should have lasted weeks. He did it in two hours. I rang him after the end of the two hours, and I asked him, he says, Is, have you really done it? He says, completely resolved, a miracle. What was the part? The part was to hand your worries, your concerns over to Jesus and let him deal with it. And you know, when you do, peace will fulfill you. Peace. And then watch him in action as, he's received, as you receive that blessing. And then use that as a testimony. When you overcome that situation, that is your testimony to evangelise. Amen, bro. Isn't it? Amen. That's it is. exactly yeah. it. When you're going through a hard time, why, why does God allow that even? Because yeah. he says, when, when you put your faith in him, because he's not worried really yeah. about the hard time. He's worried about getting you through it, yeah. that you can give testimony yeah. and then you can help others yeah, that's exactly through the it. same issue. Do you know what, John? When this is resolved, you're going to be able to help others in exactly the same situation. It may not be eviction, but it's going to be people who go through stressful times because you then have got a testimony. Hallelujah. How about the importance of thanking God? Rather than asking God, you're thanking him because yeah. you've got so much faith. Yeah. You believe he's going to create this miracle. He's going to overturn any of your problems. You're saying, thank you, God, for solving this situation. Right, that is one of the best ways. Because what, what are you doing when you're thanking, mm. thanking someone, anybody? Mm. You're saying thank you. Exactly. But if when you're thanking in advance, what are you expressing? Faith. Exactly. And God always responds to faith. Always. Yeah. So, and if it's your heart and you, you're thanking him in advance, then it's an expression of faith and he honours that. I remember Derek Prince, he was, he was quite ill. And, you know, he said, right, I believe that God's going to heal me. So he thanked God breakfast, lunch and, and after dinner every time for three months and after three months he was healed great example is thanksgiving yeah wow <laughs> this one uh, brilliant brilliant program a good well time, aren't we? really good <laughs> really really good uh this one's from peter to say hi guys really enjoying tonight's studio based question and answers so thank you very much andrew uh could you please ask pastor andrew where he stands on the issue of eternal security of the believer god's richest blessings from peter Oh, we are eternally secure in him. You know, eternity doesn't start when Jesus returns. Eternity started when you said yes to Jesus. So we went, when, when we said yes to him, something spiritual happened. You may not feel it at first because our faith isn't about feelings. It's initially about making a discerning quality decision to say, yes, I follow you. You may not understand what you're doing. You may not believe it. But when you say yes to the Lord, something happens because the Holy Spirit, it says, comes into your heart and you, you become a new creation. But got to, got to picture it somehow that this Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit came and entered into us and made everything personal. So, but of course, the Holy Spirit is part of the triune, the, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. A piece of eternity came into our heart and made us eternally in a relationship with God. And I guess how long that's for? Eternally. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty secure. <laughs> You're sealed. Ephesians says, you are now sealed in the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be separated. Sealed in. 
Promise. Believe it. That's the, but that's the truth. <laughs> Amen to that. Jane in Chester's written in. Thank you, Jane, for writing in. Uh, good evening, Cyrus and Pastor Andrew. I have two questions. The first one is, I'm a little confused. Are snakes good or not good in the Bible? Boo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Snakes, well, there is, there is, I can see why I've, there's, um, can I just say I had a snake in my house? Oh, wow. And I've had so many questions about that from people in the church. So it's wow. Like, but, um, Right back in Genesis 3, it talks of um, Adam and Eve when they sinned. And what did God say? He gets the three together, doesn't he, there? Satan, Adam, and Eve. And Eve, he says, you know, uh, childbearing pains, they're for you. Yeah. <laughs> to Adam, he says, the ground shall now be cursed because of you. Yeah, and he says it will bear thorns and thistles. That's why Jesus had the, the thorns and thistles on his head because it was a symbol of him taking that curse for us. But he didn't curse them, but he did curse the serpent. He did curse the serpent who, uh, Satan came in the form of the serpent, so he cursed him. So the snake, no matter what we think, no matter what signs we've seen the snake on, it's just, you know, and people of you know, health organizations have used the snake. Yep. But biblically, the snake is a symbol of curse and of sin and against God. So you see that because it was cursed. Mm -hmm. The good thing is as well, straight after that, it says that, it, that uh, it'll be bruised. His head will be crushed as they bruise the one, the seed. Well, the seed is Jesus. It's actually, a mess it's actually a messianic promise that Satan's head shall be crushed because of the seed, which is Jesus Christ, by the way. I'll just throw that in for, for free. <laughs> but um, so we see that the snake is that. Um, and all the way through scripture, you can cause some confusion because you'll think, well, the snake, wasn't it put on a pole in Numbers? Mm -hmm. In Numbers chapter six, it was put on a pole. And it says, all those who are bitten by the little snakes shall be healed because of this snake on a pole. Must be a good symbol. Mm -hmm. No, it's not at all. They were grumbling against Moses. They were grumbling against God. So God sent little snakes to bite the people of God and they died. Mm -hmm. So God says, get them to get a pole, which is the same word for tree, by the way, which is the same word used in Hebrew for the cross. Wow. Hope, you, hope, you, hope, you, hope yeah. the viewers and yourself get this. And put a bronze snake on. And all those who look up shall be healed. So what's, what's all that about? Well, interestingly, is that that was a forego. That was a prophetic vision of Jesus on the cross. Because oh. as it, it says in John, actually, as the bronze snake was lifted up, so all shall be healed. So Jesus shall, will be lifted up mm -hmm. for all who believe in him shall be saved. Yep. So, and how was that? Because sin had to be paid for. Mm -hmm. So the symbol of the snake, which is of the curse, Jesus became the curse. He became the serpent so that we who believe in him shall re receive eternal wow. life through him. Yes. So the snake is still that. There's a real interesting thing as well, which um, in that number six, so those who saw it were healed as they looked up. Two things I'd like to add to that mm -hmm. is uh, Pharaoh, who was around, um, he was considered God. Guess what he had on his head? It would have been a snake symbolizing God. And they, they would have had gods that they would have to worship. And there was a specific God in those days, which I'm talking about now in Numbers chapter six, in those days was a God that if it was, it was a picture of a serpent, if you looked at it, you would die. Right. So God, what's God really saying here? He's saying, your God, when you look at it, will die. Me, the God, Yahweh, when you look at me through my son, Jesus Christ, on the pole that is to come, shall live. He was challenging their faith. He was saying, you do what I say brings life. Mm -hmm. Or you can keep being bitten by the snakes. So snakes all the way through the Bible is a symbol of, of, the, of the cursor. And as I say, that, that's in Galatians, it says that um, he took the curse on the cross, on the tree, on the pole, so that we could go free. Very good indeed. Jane's also asking, is it right or acceptable to have an instant dislike to some people? 
It's a fair question. It's a there good you question. Go. It's a real question. Is that from you, that side? That's from Jane. <laughs> I can show you. God, this, this is like... <laughs> um, there's a, in 1 Corinthians 12, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12, it talks of um, spiritual gifts. There's four areas of where spiritual gifts are, and here it talks of the spiritual gifts. So, some of those gifts are the spirit of uh, discernment. Um, do you know, we're going to need more of this in the age that we live in. Do you know, in Matthew 25, it talks of deception nine times. One of the signs of the end of the age is, is um, deception. So we're going to need this gift of discernment as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. So, you know, we may get to discern what God will give us a spirit of discernment. There's also a spirit of dis discerning the spirits. Mm -hmm. What does that also mean? It's another gift in 1 Corinthians 12 where people are given this gift to discern what's the spirit behind what people represent and what they're saying. And we need these gifts mm. in these days mm. because who are false? Who are speaking falsely? You know, who are the false teachers? Who are the false prophets? Who are the t falseness in the church? Mm. That's why we've got to stand for truth. Mm. Mm. You know, so um, no, it isn't wrong. It's actually a gifting from God that we start to discern things about what people are really saying to us. And that may give us this funny feeling about another person. So we weigh what they say and we weigh our relationship. So if, um, if we are wondering about the feasibility of someone or why, wondering why there's this something about them that you may not like, maybe God is showing us a, the spiritual uh, gift of discernment or discerning of spirits to protect us. Mm. Don't say everything's wrong just because, we actually think of this word judgment. Can I just add, yeah. add something else? Yep. This is a big word in the Bible, judging others. Yep. Now this is important uh, regarding this because we tend to think we can't judge others. We yeah. can't judge anything. Mm. I've had someone say, well, I, I can't judge that because the Bible says don't judge. Yeah. Well, that's not the meaning. There's two meanings of to judge. The original meaning in Hebrew has two meanings for to judge. Okay. We're not to judge the person, but we are to judge events mm -hmm. or specific things. So let's not judge one another. Mm -hmm. That's that's definitely means. Yep. But but we must judge what is right and what is wrong. Absolutely. So that's important to remember because we some people will actually not judge anything. No, don't upset that person. Don't say that. We can't judge them. And that's false. There's two meanings. Andrew, we've got about nine, eight minutes, eight and a half minutes. Still tons and tons of emails oh, coming in. God bless you. Let's see if we can get some <laughs> short answers and get as many through as we can. Okay. This is from Jane, which is another Jane that's written in. Hi, men of God. In the old days, which I remember, we used to write letters which ended in thank you in anticipation. I end a lot of my prayers with this and feel total peace. Wow. Shalom from Jane. Uh, thank Beautiful. You. Beautiful. That's I a agree. Lovely thank one. You thank you. It was a great word. Uh, this next one here is, that was a quick one. That was a quick <laughs> one. <laughs> Pete's, uh, Pete from Merseyside has written in, say, hi, Cyrus and Pastor Andrew. Cyrus, does Pastor Andrew believe that the third building of the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in these last days and the subsequent abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, 15, will trigger the second coming of Jesus Christ? Yep. Yep. Why? <laughs> <laughs> you said that short was good. That was really good, yeah. Prof Prophets, Daniel chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 9 talks of the 77s. Do you know, if you, I, I, I've taught on the 77s and it's an incredible prophetic and accurate, it actually gives the exact day, the exact time even, of Jesus' death on the cross. Wow! After 183, 868 days mm. prophesied in, in the book of Daniel. But it also talks of, and Jesus refers to the prophet Daniel too, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. He endorses the message in Daniel. Oh, that's why I believe it. It's okay. in Daniel anyway, and Jesus endorses him. And he mentions there about the temple in the end days. Mm. He'll be there. Uh, this one's saying, good evening to you both. For someone who is backslidden, how do you know you are generally saved when you haven't experienced a Holy Spirit baptism? How does one that they have been baptised, how does one know that they have been baptised by the Holy Spirit? Mm. Well, the Bible actually talks of that. It just says, you'll know in your spirit. Your spirit testifies to your spirit that you're a child of God. When you said yes to Jesus, it's a spiritual thing. When he said yes to Jesus, this is how it works. We're made up of a spirit, soul, and body in that order. The Holy Spirit comes upon us. 
It, it trans, transcends over our soul, which is our mind, will and emotions, and then we act it out in our body. Satan does it the other way. He does it, he, he, he encounters our flesh, then to our mind and then to our spirit and tries to move us away. So you'll know because the Holy Spirit who came into your heart will testify that you are a child of God. Can I just add something really important? Very is, short. Very, very short is that ask yourself, um, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Because the enemy wants you to doubt that. If you're trying to follow Jesus, even if you fail, trying to follow Jesus through obedience, showing that your nature has changed. If your nature's changed, you're a child of God because now you're following the Lord. This one's John in Belfast saying, good evening, gentlemen. I absolutely love the Q&A show every week. Thank you in advance for this great program. I have always been very curious about the potential of a demon living inside me or someone else. My question is this, and I appreciate that this affects people in different ways. How can I genuinely tell if someone is under the influence of a demon? Andrew, again, I seek your level of expertise and opinion on this matter. Thank you and blessings, John in Belfast. Do you know the most fundamental way isn't it for me to, to talk about it, but actually to guide uh, John from Belfast in that. Yes. We've got a deliverance ministry team in the ark. Against all opposition, we, there's an there's a incredible group of, of people who have spent a lot of time preparing to help people through deliverance. Now, if they come through the ark WhatsApp, uh, so the ark um, website, and you look on there, it will give the, the deliverance team the, the email of them. Contact them and maybe even arrange what we're doing right now at this moment. People are coming over to receive deliverance through this team. And that is ArcSpain, Arc, the, the ArcSpain.com, is that right, yeah, the Arc, website? Yeah, on the website. And if you, you go through onto uh, on one of the links there, it'll yep. give you the arc.deliverance arc at yahoo.com. Is okay. the email. email that, book your appointment in. If they search on Google the Ark, the Ark Church Spain, they'll find that yeah. and they'll be able to find the yeah. links. Okay, this one's from Mike to say, is hell a place of everlasting torture? Yep. Okay. Uh, the next one here, it says, even in Bible college, there were people that, was that were lecturing and did not know God. That is the same in the schools and the children were out of, and, at the, and the children will lose out. That is from Joy. Thank uh, you absolutely. Yeah, absolutely is the truth. Uh, this one is saying, hi, Andrew and Cyrus. In the Bible, it says we should give thanks to all circumstances for this will of God. Does that mean that even if we're going through horrible things, that this is God's will for us to be in this situation? Or am I mistaken? That's from Samuel. Yep, not necessarily. God says, if, you're, if you are persecuted, let it be for doing good. You know, if you're doing good, if you're doing God's will, you will come under persecution. You will have a hard time. But, but it also says in James, don't let your hard times be your own fault. Mm. So God will lead us, lead us into hard times. But remember that he doesn't want you there continually, whether it be your fault or not. The promotion at the other end is what is wonderful. Uh, hi, Cyrus and Andrew. We, I loved your sermon on the God Day today. So that was your God Day today, Andrew. Okay. Please, can you explain the wonder of number three? We have noticed so many times in the gospel how it seems to be in such an important number. Wow, it's huge. <laughs> F3 is everywhere. Do you know, even in the alphabet, we're doing the alphabet at the moment, the Hebrew alphabet, the number three, incredibly, is the same number for the Holy Spirit which of course is the third person of the, of the triune. It's, um, it also is symbolic, not only of that, but of, it also means number three in the, in the Hebrew alphabet, camel or goat's hair, so, or camel hair. Exactly what depicting John the Baptist who, who came to show Jesus, prepared the way for Jesus, just as the Holy Spirit does. But the three is an incredible, because if you look at Esther, if you look at what Jesus said, or, um, uh, Jonah, three, Jesus said that just as Jonah was in the, the, uh, the large fish, the great fish for three days and three nights, so I shall be in, the, in the, the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. It's a huge number three in the Bible. Three and seven are the most common, but three is particularly important because Jesus rose from the dead after three days and three nights. This is another viewer now asking about forgiveness. How can they forgive somebody who's done something wrong against them? Do it. Don't hesitate. Do it. You know, we're commanded to do it. Jesus actually says, you shall be forgiven as much as you forgive others. 
It's, it's not a, an emotion. It's a quality decision to forgive. Remember, when you forgive, Sai, mm -hmm. remember when you forgive, you're letting yourself out of jail, not the other person. And if someone is doing something wrong against you as well, the importance of praying for that person and praying for their heart to change as well. Yeah, yeah. Pray for them and speak to them. Tell them. Take, take uh, the Bible says, speak to them. If they still don't, take a witness. If they still don't, tell it to the church. This viewer is having, suffering from panic attacks for over 25 years. Okay. What can we tell them? Well, uh, pray. First thing, pray. if they have already. If they haven't already, pray and fast. It's... I had uh, attacks while I was um, for, for in nightmares. One prayer solved a 15-year nightmare. What was that prayer? Lord, take this away. If you know it's fearful, if it's a fearful event, it's not of God. Mm. Your dreams and your, your night, are, are, if they're fearful, they're not of God. You can pray them out. Don't accept them into your life. Don't accept that in your life. Amen. Pastor Andrew, dear, thank you so much indeed for joining us on the Q&A show. Welcome. I will Is see that you next time already? to my special guest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to all our viewers for joining us. We've searched so many questions on tonight's program as well. Don't forget, we've got a video on demand. Go on to revelationtv.com slash videos. Check the Q&A show and you'll be able to watch this program and share it with your friends. Just like Andrew said, share all your, all your problems into Jesus Christ. Put it in his hands. Let him take it over and he'll give you that peace in your heart. And I pray that in Jesus' mighty name for your life tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care. God bless and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.